tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the horror hell. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself if you dare. Come inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found. Join me then, dear listener, for the final stretch of our trek to the edge of reason and the end of sanity. I think it's only fitting to start back at the beginning. Don't you agree? A pit stop then to the apocalypse for another visit to the twisted end times of author Kevin David Anderson. So gear up and hold on tight. This particular roller coaster is a bumpy ride indeed. I give you momentum. The world wasn't ending quickly like a well-placed shotgun blast to the mouth, but rather like Dwight always figured it would. Twisting and squirming, sucking in every last foul breath, hoping for just one more shot at life. Dwight knew his time was limited, but he was making an all-American effort to see how long he could last. Not out of any survivalist mentality. It was more plain old-fashioned curiosity. He wanted to hang on to the end to see how the world would finally blink out. Would there be a bang? Or just a pathetic whimper? Even after it really hit the fan out there, Dwight never ventured far from the carnival grounds. His fellow carnies had all left to spend their final moments with family members. But Dwight's family was still here. The decaying facade of the carnival, its dust-covered rides and derelict concessions, and the rigged carny games were the only family he needed. The gaming area, where bows emptied their wallets trying to win a badly stitched teddy bear for their wide-eyed gals, was the place Dwight had spent most of his adult life. So why should he leave simply because the world was ending? By the time the girl had wandered into the carnival, Dwight could hardly remember how many weeks it had been since the world lost power. Had it been weeks? A month, maybe? The girl limped over to a bench next to his venue the strongman game. He had been watching her for a while. She staggered, fell, pushed herself up, then collapsed onto a wooden bench. 
its paint peeling in handfuls from the chemicals and unnatural compounds that had rained down from space, an event that CNN had christened the last catastrophe. He waited until she sat up before he approached. She looked like she had been startled enough, so he approached carefully. She did not raise her head as he neared. He purposely shuffled his feet, attempting to capture her attention, but her gaze remained downcast. Perhaps she had fallen asleep. He stood waiting at the tip of her shadow. Her body wasn't in great shape, but whose was these days? At least she still looked human. Mostly. Her clothes were threadbare, only enough left to cover the areas demanding concealment in the former modest world. Hey, you alive? Her head shot up with a start, eyes wide. For a moment it seemed she was going to flee. Her arms rose and then collapsed into her lap. Her terrified expression melted into a kind of acceptance and she sighed. Dwight did his best to appear non-threatening. Now I ain't that ugly as I... He smiled, showing a few missing teeth. In a world where most were losing teeth, hair, and the proper use of their limbs as appendages mutated to something less human-looking, Dwight felt pretty darn good about his appearance. End of the world or not, the bar on the scale of attractiveness had been lowered considerably. Bet you think it's all about strength, Dwight said. She managed to raise an eyebrow. What? Dwight pointed to the strongman game where an oversized sledgehammer leaned against the launcher, smacking that bell between the ladies' honkers. At the top of the game's pole, some twenty feet above the ground, was a painted woman, her breast heaving forward and the bell just covering the nipples. It's not about strength, you know. Dwight got down on one knee like a man about to propose. It's all about momentum. I know. I used to work this game, you know, when things weren't so, um, different. The hint of a smile flickered in her eyes. What did you used to do? You know, um, before. She grinned as if what she was about to say was funny. I was a mortgage analyst for a title company. Dwight ran his fingers through his greasy hair. No, no, no idea what that is. Guess it don't matter now. <laughs> Do it. She shook her head. I'm Dwight. <laughs> Carrie. Nice to meet you, Carrie. I don't mean to. She leaned forward. Do, do you have any food? Dwight looked around as if searching for listening ears, then said, Not on me, but I got a place under the funhouse. Ain't much. Could you go get the food and bring it here? Don't trust me, yeah? Hell, I don't blame you. God only knows what you've been through. What we all been through. She sat back on the bench. Averting his gaze. Look, it's not safe to bring food out here. And besides, it'll be dark soon. You knows what that brings, don't you? Carrie nodded slowly, seeming to relive some horrific memory. Dwight slapped his hands together and got to his feet. Tells you what, Carrie. If I can ring that bell there three times using only one arm, will you come back with me? She looked up at him. <laughs> I'm sure you can. You used to work here. Dwight walked to the game and picked up the sledgehammer. Okay, you caught me trying to be sly. But I can't pass up the chance to show off for a lady. He held the hammer out as if asking permission. She smiled and blushed. Well, go ahead. With one hand, Dwight started swinging the sledgehammer around in big, over-the-shoulder circles, each revolution building in momentum, until finally, he brought the hammer down on the launcher, right in the sweet spot. The shot rocketed up and smacked the bell with a clang. Like I said, nothing to do with strength. They repeated the action and rang the bell again. By the time the pang of the third ring had faded... Gary was clapping, 
but not hard enough to make any sound. Dwight dropped the hammer and held out his hand. It's all about momentum. Now we best get a move on, cause, uh, that bell tends to attract the ones that slither. And a couple of them suckers is awful fast. She nodded and took his hand. He pulled her up, amazed at how light she was. Couldn't have been a hundred pounds. She walked most of the way but needed to grab hold of his shoulders as they descended the stairs in the funhouse. Dwight sealed the door behind them and then stuffed towels around the cracks of the door. The night wanderers had an acute sense of smell and more than once they'd stumbled down the stairs, following the aroma of Dwight's flesh. When Dwight finished, Carrie was looking around, candlelight flickering in her eyes. Dwight reached for one of the middle-sized sledgehammers he had begun polishing just after the world started to go. He propped it on his shoulder. There's no food down here, Carrie said with a worried look. Oh, there is now, Dwight swung the hammer. It connected with the side of her head, right on the sweet spot. Like a twig giving way to a heavy boot heel. Her neck snapped cleanly. Her lifeless form stood there for a beat, a marionette in the brief moment after its strings had been cut. Then it slumped to the floor. Dwight held up the business end of the sledgehammer in his right hand, amazed at how little blood spotted its surface. They felt it was because he didn't bludgeon his food like some wild animal. He swung the hammer artfully. A master of momentum. Of course, carnivorous carnies are one of the many dangers faced by those ascending the sinister switchbacks of the Horror Hill. Well, no matter what games they may entice you with, the house will always win. The experienced traveler knows better than to leave the path to follow distant lights in the woods. No matter how lovely the ignis fatuous may be at a distance, for the fool's fire casts the deadliest shadows of all. From author Tom Farr, I give you Hollow. Then, dark thunderheads blanketed the Suffolk sky, and fat droplets of rain began to spatter the golden leaves scattered across the ground. In the distance, silver lightning streaked between the clouds above, illuminating rolling hills and terrified sheep scampering for shelter. Jack began to count the seconds as his father had taught him, barely reaching eight before an enormous crack of thunder boomed across the sky. One of the cabinets in the study contained four or five model cannons, and he imagined this was how their functioning counterparts must have once sounded. He looked over his shoulder towards Night Hill Manor, his home, distant and aloof on the cusp of the valley unsure if he was expected to go inside now that the weather had turned foul. Although, in truth, Jack didn't consider it foul at all. A storm like this would be perfect for playing soldiers. Anyway, his father would come and collect him in the jeep if he wanted Jack home early. He'd been shooting Nazis for about ten minutes when he heard the bleeding. It was almost inaudible over the now considerable rumbling overhead and it took Jack a few seconds to locate the source. There, just beyond the fence marking the border of King's Forest, in a dense patch of withered brown bracken, he squinted against the rain, and a pair of twisted horns resolved themselves, curving down around a head covered in shaggy black fur. He didn't need to see the snapped tip of one of the horns to recognize the visitor. Sebastian! Jack shouted, dropping his plastic luger in the grass and hurrying over to the fence. All thoughts of war and soldiers pushed aside by the delight of the sudden reappearance of his friend. 
It had been over three weeks since he'd woken up to find the goat absent from its pen. His father had nearly grumbled about loose latches and set Maxwell to fitting a new gate, convinced the marauding animal would make its way home in due course. But to Jack, after Jiminy Cricket and Pinocchio's escape the week before, Sebastian's disappearance had upset him quite considerably. So, it was with no hesitation that he scrambled over the wire fence and followed the retreating goat into the forest. He had been walking for quite a while, picking his way through autumnal foliage and around withered trees with only fleeting glimpses of Sebastian's shaggy head to guide him when he stepped into the clearing. As he did so, a deafening peal of thunder sounded above, and he flinched despite himself. Then... He noticed the long, low table standing in the middle of the clearing, and when he saw the pair seated at it side by side, he began to smile. Jiminy Cricket, holding a pink floral teacup in one furry paw, a dark green flat cap cocked back on his head, and a yellow scarf fluttering gently in the breeze, and Pinocchio, who looked simply marvelous in a deep burgundy waistcoat, top hat, and matching cravat. The hares twitched their heads to regard Jack as he took a few tentative steps across the clearing, and Pinocchio motioned stiffly with a thin foreleg for him to join them at the table. There were others there who Jack didn't recognize. A grinning fox whose tooth-filled snout poked out from beneath a black-trimmed fedora. A slim white ferret, similar to those that Maxwell kept behind the stables stared at him with glazed yellow eyes sipped from a teacup, something that looked like a small monkey crouched at the opposite end of the table, its human-like features obscured beneath falls of lace and a frilled pink bonnet. Jack sat down in the only empty seat, opposite Jiminy Cricket and Pinocchio, beside a large badger, its snouted face dominated by pale white eyes, and a tabby and white cat with long, drooping whiskers. Behind Cricket and Pinocchio stood a huge tree with withered, drooping branches and a hollow trunk. Sebastian's face was barely visible in the darkened hollow, but his dull red eyes winked in the gloom and Jack waited for him to come out. The goat seemed reluctant to leave, however, and shook its head in response, retreating further into the murk. Something cold and filthy with bristles touched Jack's hand, and he instantly recoiled before realizing that it was only Jiminy Cricket, reaching across the table to place his diminutive paw on top of Jack's equally tiny hand. The hare's mouth pulled back in a lopsided grin, and the boy smiled back. So engrossed was he as the hare showed him the plates and cups and teapots and cutlery lining the table that he didn't hear the dried-out leaves crunching behind him. A gloved hand clamped over his mouth and a strong arm wrapped itself around him, yanking his hand away from Jiminy Crickets and pulling him down, 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 into darkness. Now, Martin dreamt of music, soft and distant but beautiful nonetheless. Faint noises in the corridor roused him from his fitful slumber. Was that a pair of tiny feet slapping against the plush maroon carpet? A slight form running past the slightly ajar bedroom door? No. Of course it wasn't. Maxwell would have retired to bed by now, and even if he hadn't, the boxer-turned-groundskeeper's days of running anywhere were long since past. Nobody ran in Night Hill Manor's paneled corridors now. Not for almost a year. Not since Jack. Oh, God. Martin swung his legs out of bed, elbows resting on his thighs, put his head in his hands and began to cry. He should have sent Maxwell to fetch Jack that day. He should never have let him play so far from the manor in the first place. Without Maria, he hadn't had a clue how to care for their son. When he was young, his parents let him roam far and wide, so it was his natural assumption that Jack should be allowed to do the same. Of course, back then, pedophiles and child murderers had been relatively unheard of. The world had changed, but Martin had not changed with it. 
Raising his head, he looked around the room, the Napoleonic oil paintings, the gilded furniture, the gold-trimmed oak paneling, even this godforsaken manor house. He'd tear it all down with his bare hands if it would return Jack to him. Standing, he crossed to the window, which opened onto Nighthill Manor's rear garden and the valley beyond, and the woods. The woods where detectives reasoned his only son had been stolen from him forever. Martin's breath caught in his throat, and he felt as though an ethereal hand had reached into his chest and taken hold of his heart. About halfway down the valley, moving away from the house towards the woods was a bobbing orange light. A lantern. Martin narrowed his eyes, but was unable to discern the shape or size of whoever was carrying it. Maxwell? No. The elderly man wouldn't risk the valley with its holes and pitfalls at this hour. He would know better. There was no need for either of them to go into the woods at all, let alone this late at night. Martin wasted no time at all in scrambling into a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, pulling on his jacket as he hurtled down the sweeping spiral staircase to the entrance hall. On his way to the front doors, he passed a dark shape against the far wall, frozen in a stream of moonlight. The piano. His son's piano. Oh, Jack, he thought as he pulled on his walking boots. Oh, Jack, I'm so, so sorry. He had his hand on the antique silver door handle when his mind fully registered what he'd just seen. The piano, yes, but he'd actually seen the piano, seen its polished teak surface and ivory keys, bright white like rows of teeth. Nobody had touched the piano since, since Jack. Maxwell had thoughtfully covered the beautiful instrument with a thick velvet sheet, and that was how it had stayed. Now, the sheet was pulled on the floor, to the right of the piano, yanked aside and left where it had fallen. Rage welled up inside Martin like a ferocious storm. Somebody had been here. In his house. But that intrusion paled in comparison to the fact that the intruder had touched his son's piano. He snatched the door open and dashed out into the night. From the shadowed doorway to the dining room. A pair of burnished yellow eyes watched the man leave. Satisfied, the stoat slipped out the way it had entered, through the kitchen. Its breathing was torn and ragged, its blackened tongue lolling from its mouth bursting with needle-sharp teeth. The faint groan of shifting wood and the near inaudible hum of whirring gears followed it through the darkness. The woods were black as pitch, and Martin cursed himself a fool for not bringing a torch. He'd lost sight of the orange light when it disappeared into the clusters of spindly trees, and now he caught only the merest snatches of its flickering glow in the distance. His shins were bleeding, and he'd cut his face the first time he'd fallen, but that didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Nothing except catching whoever it was that had defiled his precious memories of Jack. The only things he had left. There was a definite awareness of perception here. He cautiously scanned his surroundings for inquisitive eyes. Something moved in the bracken off to the left, but by the time he'd snapped his head in that direction, the motion had ceased. The light reappeared directly ahead of him and he hurried towards it. He kept low to the ground, moving as silently as possible, but was almost shocked into screaming when something sleek and furry brushed past his legs before vanishing into the undergrowth. Composing himself and breathing deeply, he stepped into a clearing that had once been flooded with yellow tape and ultraviolet light. There, Beneath the eaves of a drooping willow where he held a distraught Maria's forensic teams combed the area was a table. Pink 
plastic with garish chairs to match. It was the sort one would expect to see at a little girl's tea party, were it not so stained and filthy. It wasn't the table that snatched the breath from Martin's lungs, nor was it the chairs. It was the slumped form seated upon them. The lantern he'd seen the figure carrying had been placed on the table, and its flickering light illuminated the surroundings with sickening clarity. As he stepped closer, Martin raised a hand to cover his mouth. Dear God, the stench was enough to make him vomit. The warm, welcoming glow of the lantern belied its surroundings. The things at the table were monstrosities. The closest of them was an egregious fox. A fedora perched almost comically atop its head and a grimy plastic fork in its hand. What the devil was going on here? There was a bloody fox in... About to turn away, Martin froze. Its hand. Since when did foxes have hands? Against his better judgment, he looked back down. A swollen fly crawled across the pale hand protruding from the sleeve of the fox's tweed jacket. The flesh had blackened in places, sloughing away to reveal glimpses of yellowing bone. It had a strange, burnished finish to it. Stealing himself, he reached forward and tugged the fox's sleeve back. The wrist, so tiny he could have encircled it with his thumb and forefinger, ended in jagged stitches an inch or so from the hand. The remainder of the arm to be seen was thin and covered in glossy red fur. He stumbled away in horror, screaming aloud as he backed straight into the fox's neighbor. An abominable hair with a jaundiced yellow scarf wrapped tightly around its neck. It tumbled out of its seat and... hung in the air. The air itself seemed to pull taut. Wires, so fine as to be almost imperceptible, ran from every major joint of the hare's body up into the branches of the willow suspending it in the midair like some deplorable puppet. The wires hung from the willow's branches like a giant spider web, ascending to lofty heights before descending the trunk and disappearing into the darkness of the hollow. The scarf slipped from the hare's neck and fluttered to the ground. Martin fell to his knees and vomited. His head was nestled atop the stump of a human neck rudimentary stitching holding the animal's furred cheeks in place. Needing to tear his eyes away from the bloodless, marble-like neck, he looked up at the hare's face. Realization smashed into him like a sledgehammer. Jiminy Cricket. It could be any hare, of course, but Martin knew that it wasn't. He stumbled to his feet standing groggily on his legs, threatening to give way any second. Pinocchio's paw jerked into motion, sending a rigid wave across the table to Martin. He screamed and staggered backwards. The police. He needed to call the police. In the willow's hollow trunk, twigs cracked underfoot. Martin exploded off the table in a spray of cheap plastic dinnerware, nausea and law enforcement forgotten, knocking Pinocchio aside and crashing into a monstrous monocle-wearing pig. He shoved the thing away in disgust, repulsed at the feel of its clammy skin, snatched the lantern from the table, and squeezed into the hollow. The stench was overwhelming. One summer when he was a boy, he'd visited his uncle's slaughterhouse. Beneath the scorching August sun, the odor of decaying flesh had infested every inch of the place. This was worse, and Martin immediately saw why. Leaning against the wall was a long metal pole. Impaled upon its tip was a goat's head. He knew it was Sebastian without even looking. Aligned vertically next to it a row of wooden levers and cogs. 
So that was where the wires led. Dear God. How long had this maniac been watching his family? He raised the lantern higher and answered his own question. Hundreds. Maybe thousands of Polaroids were pinned to the inside of the stump. Jack laughing and petting Sebastian. Jack standing on Martin's shoulders, wearing his Spider-Man t-shirt and waving an ice cream above his head. They had been taken from the edge of the tree line, judging by their angles. The next photo turned Martin's blood to ice. Wrapped in a duvet adorned with purple dinosaurs, Jack dozed peacefully. One hand was clutching the duvet. The other was snaked around Martin's shoulders as the two of them dozed peacefully. That had been Jack's fourth birthday. Oh, God. He was crying now, tears streaming down his face as he took in the twisted visual history spread before him. Two A4-sized photos were tacked in the center. Martin howled in agony. The first showed Jack, wearing the same khaki shorts and brown t-shirts as the day he disappeared. He was lying on his back, pale and motionless. Eyes closed and hands clasped on his chest. Next to him was a pig, bloated and bloody. Beneath them both was a sheet of light blue tarpaulin. Between them, Small, clear bags of what looked like sawdust, tiny blocks of wood, and a pile of minuscule cogs and gears. In the second, Martin lay sleeping in his own bed, standing beside him, staring fixedly at his prone form, was a monocle-wearing pig. The photograph was dated September 22nd, Today, something shuffled behind him, fallen leaves crunching beneath its cloven hooves. Martin couldn't turn to face it, couldn't even move. Silence. He stood in the reeking hollow with his heart thudding in his ears. The lantern slipped from his grasp, and something was pressed into his palm to replace it. Holding the plastic luger in a white-knuckled grip, Martin sank to his knees. Small arms enfolded him from behind, and a cold snout pressed itself against the back of his neck. The subtle click of hidden machinery was followed by a shallow breath. From the darkness, a rasping voice. Father. us to the wilds of the African bush, where a hunter's quarry blurs the bloody line between predator and prey. From author Tony Knighton, I give you The Scavengers. I'll take no less than five a man, Jimmy. I say we stand firm on that. He spoke into my right ear, raising his voice to be heard over the engine noise. I nodded. I didn't want to get into it with him again. Not right then. I needed to concentrate on driving. The trail was rutted, and we were jouncing badly. Better to let him think what he wanted. He kept on, though. That kraut bastard isn't going to rip us off again. I couldn't tell if it was meant to be a question or a statement of fact. I didn't care. Ace was just letting his nerve show. He'd be okay when the time came. 
I kept a straight face and said, Heh, right on, man. Fucking A. And I felt him scowling at me. Fuck you two. He turned in the open cab and pointing at me, shouted to Frederick and Joseph, the two Bontas in the back. All the fucking same, these yanks. I watched them in the rearview mirror. They ignored him, but grinned, not able to hear what he said, not really caring. They'd been educated in mission schools. Both spoke English along with half a dozen other languages, but they feigned ignorance when Ace was on a tear. They knew him well enough to know he was just blowing off steam. They stood in the truck bed facing outboard in opposite directions, scanning the dry grasslands, each with a Kalishnikov slung over his shoulder, muzzle down. It was a tough ride holding onto the tops of the high wooden truck sides, their legs bent at the knees, riding out the bumps. We weren't on a road. There weren't any roads where we were going. The trail we were on roughly followed a dry stream bed that wouldn't see much water until the rains came. They said, I tell you I need to five, Jimmy. Bella won't wait forever. He took a pouch from his khaki shirt pocket. There were dark sweat stains under his arms, rimmed with lines of dried salt. It's a beautiful place, Jimmy. Not some slop shoot. A real old-style pub. He chuckled. <laughs> Can't you just see me in a barman's white shirt and black trousers? He unrolled the pouch, grabbed a thick wad of brown leaf tobacco and shoved it into the side of his mouth. I could see it. Ace looked a lot more like a bartender than what he was. If he'd stayed at home, he might this very moment be happily tapping pints of Smittix somewhere along the falls road. It was time to let a little air out of his bubble. We don't know how big a load we're going to take. We'll have to wait and see. I took up the water jug from the floorboards and drank. He was quiet for a moment, then sat back. Aye, you're right. I'm just hoping to see enough from tonight's labors to get out of all this. Do you know? His speech lapsed into the rhythms of his youth as he finished the sentence. Over the years, he'd worked to rid himself of his brogue, only slipping into it in times like now, when he felt sorry for himself or for comic effect when his mood was up. I didn't leave the old place soon enough to lose it from his speech. Not completely, he liked to say. He hadn't left soon enough to stay out of the kind of trouble that prevented his return either. He'd never gone into detail, but considering his heritage and disposition, it was a good bet that some of the boyos from the Royal Ulster Constabulatory would like to have a talk with him. He waved away the water as I offered it. This should be a good payday, I said. Let's do the job and be done with it. We haven't worked all that much lately. It only got him worked up again. I'm well aware that we've not worked in recent times. I just can't be as casual about our upcoming transaction as you seem to be. I don't trust the prick. He's selling out his associates just so he can realize a slightly larger profit. What prevents him from treating us in kind? He gripped the top of the windshield as we rolled over a depression. I looked back and forth between him and the trail and said, These aren't his regular guys. Kuhn thinks they're deserters from Botswana. It doesn't matter. He doesn't trust them to play fair, so he decided to take it off them. We can't really expect the same money these guys were going to get. They've been hunting, hiding out for days. We're only looking at a few hours' work. Ace was unconvinced. I don't like it. He spit over his shoulder and folded his arms across his chest. I don't like dealing with the kraut, fucking middleman. He was starting to annoy me. I shifted a little in the seat. The 357 I carried on my belt was digging into my hip. Look, he's doing a job neither of us wants to do. Neither of us could. I don't like him either, but we don't have the contacts. Without him, we have a truckload of pretty tusks we can't sell. I shouldn't have bothered. The worst thing to do to Ace was point out that he was wrong. I still say I want at least five. Bellow won't wait forever. It was his way of ending the conversation. I'd lived with the man's mood swing since I'd met him in Bahrain 15 years earlier. The four days it had taken to liberate Kuwait hadn't been enough for me. 
He had been looking for someone handy to help him with a bit of business. We had been doing this and that together ever since. I kept my eyes focused on the trail. It gets dark fast in the grasslands and I couldn't use headlights. Our presence in the bush with the hardware we carried would be difficult to explain to any government men that might happen upon us. A pair of Heckler Koch MP5s was on the seat between us. In the absence of conversation with Ace, I could hear Frederick jabbering away with Joseph in the bed of the truck. They were pros. In this, since they were kids. I knew what they were doing without looking at the reflection in the rearview mirror. They'd be sharp. Eyes open. But Freddy would look at his older comrade from time to time to see if his point had been taken. Joseph would smile and nod, rarely adding anything of his own. It was his habit to finger a two-headed ivory carving that hung around his neck in a leather thong and mouth something to himself. A prayer, maybe? His lips moving with recitation of a silent litany. I sensed that Joseph had long ago grown weary of this life, but was trapped, knowing nothing else. I liked the work, and the countryside only going into the cities now and then for a taste of real liquor and a woman who wouldn't give me something that would make my cock fall off. The sun was well under the horizon and I spotted the moon through the twilight, nearly full, off to my left. There were more and more trees. We were on the edge of the forest. Frederick called out. I sat up in the seat and looked at his reflection in the mirror. He pointed to our right. About fifty feet off the trail... A pack of wild dogs was making short work of a deer carcass. Ace shouted at them. A few of the dogs looked up, curious. Their eyes reflected the moonlight and seemed to glow. The animals were lean and vicious. Their ribs stood out, making zebra stripes of shadow across their mangy coats. They went back to their meal as we rolled by. Ace said, some big cat probably took that down and got barely a bite for himself before the lot showed up and chased him off. He spit over the door and turned toward me. Lousy scavengers. Capitalizing on another's hard work. His analogous reference to our situation with Coon wasn't lost on me, but I was too busy to indulge him in his petulance. He took one more shot. If you're ever unfortunate enough to be facing down a pack of dogs or a pack of Zulus... He nodded in the direction of the two in the truck bed. The proper course of action is the same. Keep a prayer on your lips and say the last round for yourself. He patted my revolver with the back of his hand. I drove on, following his directions to the ambush site he picked down. It was a natural bottleneck. The trail hemmed in at this point by the tree line and a sharp curve in the dry stream. The bunch we were taking out would need to travel miles out of their way to avoid this choke point. We knew they were heading to meet Kuhn at the outskirts of Tsumeb, the rail junction in that part of the country. They'd come down from ivory poaching in the Kavongo region, ranging even into Angola. The big elephants didn't travel this far south in the dry season. Using the winch mounted on the front of the truck, we dragged a downed tree across the trail on the far side of the curve. Then... We hid the truck in the bush, took up positions, and waited. Nightfall revealed a million stars. They came in two vehicles. I could see that they were green hands, inexperienced. The truck carrying the tusks was following too closely behind the lead vehicle, some Asian version of a rover. Ace and I had them flanked on their left side. Joseph and Frederick waited fifty yards up trail blocking any possibility of their doubling back. We fired at the same time, the two of us putting a pair of rounds each into the truck driver's ear, turning his head into oatmeal just as the lead vehicle braked to stop at our improvised roadblock. It worked out better than we'd hoped. The truck slammed into the back of the rover, steam geysered from the crushed radiator. The driver's headless body fell forward onto the steering wheel, and the horn blared. We kept firing, picking them off easily as they scrambled from the damaged vehicles. Frederick and Joseph did their share, killing the gunmen in the back of the truck before they could recover and return fire. Only one of the poachers showed any field craft at all, 
rolling off the far side of the truck and staying low, firing bursts in our direction to give us something to think about. If they'd all been as good as him, we'd have had more of a contest on our hands. But, as it was, we had him bracketed. Joseph got the angle and ended it. We approached cautiously, running crouched. Frederick got there first and went among the vanquished poachers, dispensing headshots as insurance. As I got closer, I saw that they were kids, child soldiers, the oldest not yet twenty. Their clothes were tattered. The insides of their mouths were stained red from chewing caught. Sub-Saharan armies used kids for clearing minefields and other suicidal tasks. These boys had tired of their roles as cannon fodder and struck out on their own, just like Frederick and Joseph had years before. They just hadn't been as lucky. Ace went straight to the truck, looking into the bed, inspecting the load of tusks. It's... It's not enough, he shouted over the truck horn. He loosed a stream of tobacco juice onto the parched ground. Joseph wandered among the dead poachers. He found the last of them, the one he'd killed. The body rested on its side, face down. Joseph rolled him onto his back, gently lifting the slain boy's shoulder with the toe of his boot. The boy appeared to stare off into space, eyes wide with the abruptness of it all. A fly lit on his right pupil. Ace wrenched open the driver's side door, grabbing a handful of shirt at the shoulder. He dragged the body out of the cab. It fell in a heap. The horn was silenced. He reached into the cab and brought out a huge rifle, an elephant gun. There's something, anyway. It was double-barreled like a shotgun. He broke it open, hinged at the breech, and looked down the barrels then inspected the markings on the stock. It's an old Beretta, Jimmy. He set the rifle across the bench seat in the cab. Fucking hell, he spit again. Joseph was still looking at the dead boy. He leaned over to inspect something more closely and started to cough. Quietly first, then more violently. I went to see what was wrong. He looked up at me the whites of his eyes big and round, freakish looking in the moonlight. He started jabbering away in a vombo, shaking and pointing at the boy. I bent to see what he was talking about, but couldn't understand. Frederick came up and looked. It is a quensu, the talisman, around his neck like Joseph's. I looked again. The dead boy had a figure on a string around his neck like Joseph did, but his was damaged. One of the heads was missing, obliterated by the shot that killed him. Frederick said, One head is Chokwu, God. The other is a Quinsu, Devil. Joseph shot off the good head, leaving the bad. He's frightened. This upsets the balance of things. I looked around. Ace was ignoring us, going to the pile of ivory. Joseph was hugging himself, muttering, the fingers of his right hand worrying his own ivory figure. I looked back to Frederick. What should we do? He shrugged. Don't ask me, I'm a Lutheran. I looked at him a moment and then started howling. I laughed until tears ran down my cheeks and I was doubled over. Frederick joined me. I was gasping as I looked back up at Joseph. His face was a horrible thing to see. He stared at us as though we had betrayed him. I sobered and began to apologize when Ace shouted, I'm glad you ladies are enjoying yourselves. Any time you could tear yourselves away, I'd fucking appreciate it. That was when I first noticed the whining of the dogs. They gathered, circling on the edge of the brush. I looked at Joseph, then Freddy. He said, Go on, I take care of Joe. He went to his friend to put an arm around the man's shoulder, speaking softly. I walked to the truck. The buck knife I carried on my left side was slapping against my leg. I put down my rifle and made fast the thong fixed to the scabbard's end, lashed it around my thigh. I stood and was about to ask Ace what he wanted when I saw the tusks. I put my hand on one of them. 
It's good quality stuff, Ace. The tusk was huge, almost six feet long. The animal it had come from must have been enormous. In the moonlight, it looked creamy and finely grained and was smooth, very smooth to the touch. It curved, twisting from its rudely hacked stump to a gracefully rounded point. It's good stuff, I said again. I heard a yell. The dog sounded closer. I fucking well know it's good stuff, Jimmy. It's just not enough. I was still looking at the load, but could hear that he turned away as he said, not split four ways. It took a moment for that last bit to register. I wheeled around, too late to stop him. I heard his HK speak twice, and finished turning in time to see Joseph and Frederick fall. I dragged the 357 out of its holster as I'd spun and was sighting down the barrel at the back of Ace's head. He raised both hands, the rifle still in his right. Easy there, Jimmy. A thin wisp of smoke oozed from the skyward pointed muzzle. What the fuck, Ace? What are you thinking? I glanced at their bodies and repeated, What the fuck? Ace stood very still. We needed to do that, Jimmy. You know I'm right. I don't know that at all. Neither do you. I didn't know what to do. You're the one that's been crying that we can't trust Coon. You just killed the two guys we could trust. I pulled the hammer back in the big revolver. Why should I trust you? Oh, well, you should trust me because I'm telling you that you can. They turned his head a little bit. I didn't have anything against those fellows, Jimmy. They just had the misfortune of outliving their usefulness. I need this money. Bello won't wait. I fired a round past his ear to shut him up. Pat Bello died eight years ago. I am sick of hearing you go on and on about some dive you're never going to buy. You'll piss this money away like you always do, you fat little prick. I looked over at Frederick and Joseph lying dead. I'm sick of you. I pulled back the hammer again. You have to trust me, Jim boy. He turned more and faced me. You have to. What else can you do? Kill me? You'd have to walk away from all that ivory. He gestured in the direction of the truck with his free hand. I kept my eyes glued on him. He grinned. You can't bring it in by yourself. Put down the howitzer and let's go get our money. He spit tobacco juice. Come on, Jimmy. I wouldn't be so stupid as to kill them with you at me back if I wanted you to, would I? The hell of it was that he was right. I motioned with the gun barrel. Put your rifle on the ground and go get the truck. He smiled. <laughs> That's the ticket, Jimmy. I'll be right back. He lowered the weapon and trotted away into the dark. I picked up both of our rifles and kept the pistol in my hand. I walked over to Joseph's body. The carved ivory piece with two hands was resting on his chest. I reached down and took it, snapping the leather thong. The head on the right was clearly that of a god. The other wore an expression of evil, almost a sneer. The dog sounded closer still. I looked up as I heard A starting the truck. I looked back at the figure. The god face's eyes were closed. Hadn't. Hadn't they been open? Ace pulled the truck around. Mentally, I shrugged. It was dark. I hadn't looked at the faces carefully. I put the figure away in my shirt pocket. We brought the trucks back to back and handed the tusks from the poachers to our own. Emboldened by our lack of concern, a dog reached one of the dead and tore into its body with a snarl. Others joined it. Watching them, my skin hurt. I split my attention between the dogs and Ace. The truck loaded, I said. You drive. Ace smiled. Good thinking, Jim boy. That way you can see my hands at all times. Right? I didn't say anything else. Just moved around to the passenger side. Before he got into the driver's seat, he said, Be a shame to leave that grand fine gun. We should take it with us. I stared at him. 
Christ, it's yours, okay? I just don't want to see it go to waste, that's all. All right, hurry it up. He trotted back to the cab of the ruined truck and drew the elephant gun off the seat. He kept the breech broken as he walked back and put the rifle on the floor of the cab between us. Got some ammo, too. He handed me five monstrous shells. Fifty caliber. More than two inches long. Nothing smaller would penetrate elephant hide. I put them in the pouch on my belt. Ace got behind the wheel, put the truck in gear and made a wide sweeping turn. We drove toward Coon and the money. Now that his spirits had recovered, he kept up a steady stream of chatter, always coming back to the cash and what he'd do with it. He'd made no further mention of Mr. Bellow's pub. I ignored the content of his words. I looked forward to taking Coon's money and parting ways with Ace forever. I idly reached into my pocket to finger Joseph's talisman. As I touched it, something pricked my finger. Shit! It had felt like a bite. I'd interrupted Ace's monologue. What? Nothing. I brought the piece out. I reasoned that there must be a sharp edge. I ran my fingers around it. It was as smooth as talc. I was about to put it away when I thought I saw the evil head wink. Ace heard it first. He let off the gas and cocked his head. Then, I heard it too. A rumbling sound, and then an angry trumpeting that could only be one thing. I put the figure away and said, Step on it! Ace picked up speed, as much as the truck would bear on the uneven trail. We couldn't tell what direction the big animal was coming from. We only knew it was coming. Ace glanced away from the trail to me and then to the big rifle on the floor. Might do us some good if you were to load that. I picked up the rifle. It was a monster. It must have weighed 20 pounds. The great animal trumpeted again, and this time, I looked in the right direction and spotted it. It was off to the right, maybe 50 yards away, silhouetted by the moon. A huge bull elephant in full charge, heading our way. Oh, there he is, he said. Oh, I see him, Jimmy. He gave it more gas, but we were carrying too much weight and bottomed out as we hit a chuck hole. The elephant wanted us and was gaining, bellowing, enraged. What was he doing this far south in the dry season? A spun the wheel and we skewed left, angling away from the animal. I dug two of the cartridges from my pouch and thumbed them into the breech and snapped it shut. Was the creature enraged by thirst? Did it want a female? I didn't know. I did know it was going to catch up with us shortly. Ace was forced to come back to the right as the creek bed curved toward us. The elephant bore down on us broadside. I stood, my right knee on the seat, and hefted the weapon, bracing it on the wooden truck side. Was it the tusks? I could see the crazed right eye of the behemoth as it galloped, eating up the last few yards of ground that separated us. I struggled to steady myself in the rocking, jouncing truck and drew a bead on that bloodshot eye. I sucked in air and held it. The thing was almost on top of us. I thought I felt its hot, angry breath. Ace screamed, Shoot, Jimmy! I fired. The rifle kicked like a wild horse. The bullet crashed into the monstrous face, just below the eye. Red exploded. The creature's head snapped back with the impact. It was dead. It just didn't know it yet. Momentum kept it moving forward, its legs still churning, running of their own accord without any command from the now lifeless brain. It struck us just behind the cab. I hadn't time to drop the rifle and hold on. I was thrown clear of the truck as it was tumbled sideways like a toy. I landed on my back. In the moonlight, I saw a wave, a dark gray tsunami rolling in my direction. Before I could scramble away, the animal's carcass came to rest on top of me, covering my legs. I couldn't move, of course. The funny thing was, it didn't hurt. At first, I thought I must be in shock, but then realized that I'd fallen lengthwise into a depression. 
a rut, and that neither the fall nor the weight of the dead beast had caused any major injury. I wiggled my toes inside my boots. I tried to look around. The hairy gray mass on top of me cut my field of vision to a difficult 180 degrees. The only way to see all of it was to lie back and crane my neck, giving me an upside-down worm's-eye view of my limited world. I looked to my left and saw the truck. It was upended, one front tire still spinning. Ace lay half in and half out of the cab. He'd been killed outright, his neck broken on impact. His head lolled at a freakish-looking angle. Our tusks, our beautiful tusks, were strewn about as though some giant had dropped a box of toothpicks. I resigned myself to a long, ugly walk out of the bush and started to scoop at the crusted earth under my ass in an effort to dig my way out from under the dead elephant. The buck knife in my left leg would have helped the effort, but I couldn't reach it. I dug with my hands. By the palmful, I scooped up dirt, mostly dust. I dug until the tips of my fingers were raw. I'd been at it for a while when I heard the first growl. I stiffened, then hurried my efforts. More joined the first. My hands scratched at the crusty soil, faster, almost frenzied. Then my fingers found the rock. My leg was wedged between it and the elephant's back. No amount of digging was going to free me. I heard a snarl and looked over at the truck. Three dogs were pulling Ace's body to pieces, tugging at hunks of flesh and gobbling them whole so as to get back to the body sooner. They were joined by two more. One ripped the meat from the dead man's upper arm. He carried it away a few steps from the others, dropping it into the dirt. He held it down with a forepaw and tore at it with his teeth. Another came toward him. He warned it away with a growl. They'd leave the elephant alone. They knew the hide would be too tough for them until it had laid in the sun for a few days and rotted, breaking down the meat. They'd go for an easier meal first. One of them trotted toward me, growling, blinking, its eyes shining in the moonlight. I shouted and tossed a handful of dirt at it. He jumped back a step, then circled. Frantic, I reached down my right side, pushing my hand between the elephant's hide and the ground. I got a finger on the handle of the 357. I pushed farther down, scraping flesh from the back of my wrist. The dogs were finishing with the tasty bits of Ace's torso. Two left it and joined the one stalking me. I got my middle and ring fingers around the curve of the handle. My thumb brushed in. The dogs postured, circling weaving, barking now and then, coming close, then darting back. I tried to face them down as I dug for the gun. Finally, grasping it firmly, I pulled, dragging it farther and farther out of the holster, out from under the mountain of flesh that imprisoned me. I pulled it all the way loose just as the lead dog sprang. I brought the gun about and fired. The big round caught the canine full in the chest and spun him in the air. He fell still in the dirt six feet in front of me. The others were on him at once, ripping him apart, slobbering. I saw the blood and pieces of meat and hair stuck between their teeth. Another looked at me. I dropped him where he stood. That gave the others pause. They jumped back a step but were joined by still more. I was enraged. Filthy scavengers... I take a few more with me. I shot three in quick succession. That was it. Save the last round for yourself. I took a deep breath, put the barrel of the big pistol in my mouth, and squeezed. Click. I pulled the trigger again and again. Nothing. I'd forgotten the round I'd shot past Ace's head. I heard a chuckle. I pulled Joseph's talisman out of my shirt pocket. The god's head was covering his face with his hands. The other was shaking with laughter. I dropped it as I felt the first bite. So we 
we've come to the final stretch, dear listener. And to sweeten this bitter terminus, I'm going to leave you with the fairy tale ending you deserve. From author Luciano Morano, I give you Witches Are for Burning, Part 2 of the Storybook Gothic series. The witch went in, the witch went out, the witch went about her day, tending wilting flowers and sweeping the walk, seemingly oblivious to the eyes that watched her from behind the slightly gapped blinds across the street. There in the dark, the siblings took turns observing their quarry. They waited, hating the woman with righteous disgust. That filthy hag, Hansel said forehead grazing the blinds, eyes fixed obsessively on the woman they'd come from so very far away to murder. Please, dear sister, remind me why we have not gotten that hideous hobby yet. In the camper's small living room, Gretel reclined with bare feet propped on the arm of the couch, working studiously at her needlepoint. Beloved brother, there is yet time. Haste makes waste. Tonight, under the cover of darkness, while she is engrossed in blasphemy, is a time to strike. Hansel groaned and slumped into a chair at the fold-out kitchen table. It was hot in the RV, though it was not the temperature that made his blood boil. He peeled off his sticky t-shirt and sat feeling beads of sweat sprout from his muscular chest and arms. Scars from long-ago burns marred his skin. He was anxious and jittery tapping his foot as he watched Gretel calmly focus on her handicraft. We will do it now, Hansel whined. Such vile corruption must be wiped out immediately, without hesitation, like cancer cells. You very well know it too. Gretel, eyeing her brother's exposed flesh with undisguised interest, leisurely crossed and uncrossed the long, slim legs that flowed out of her ragged jean shorts. A patronizing smile slithered across her elven face. Do your exercises, she said. That always calms you. Hansel began manically slapping his face and chest. I've done them. I'm tired of waiting. I want to slay her now. Gretel's nimble fingers pulled the needle through again, notching another stitch. Tell me what you'll do to her. Hansel leaned back at the chair letting his eyes wander over the vision before him. In all their travels, no matter where the good work had taken them, he'd never seen a beauty his sister's equal. Not even close. Well, first I'm going to beat her. With your hands? Gretel asked, placing the work in progress in her lap and leaning forward. Yes, Hansel said, rubbing his muscular hands together slowly teasingly, with my hands. Then I'm going to wrap my fingers around that demonic heart its throat and choke her. Oh, Hansel, Gretel pouted, crossing her arms beneath her small, high breasts. You won't kill her that quickly, will you? He laughed. Ha! Hardly. Never fear, sweet sister. Her suffering will be interminable. Gretel clapped delightedly, giggling. Darling brother, tell me more. It was all the invitation he needed. They'd been watching the witch for three long, tedious days. Forced to listen to the rabble of heathens dwelling in this ramshackle trailer park live out their squalid lives, awaiting the proper moment to strike. He stood and moved quickly to the couch. Gretel lifted her legs so that he could sit then draped them across his lap as he continued to detail the atrocities he had planned for the witch across the way. As he spoke, Hansel fervently massaged his sister's feet, hands occasionally straying further up her legs. She, in turn, encouraged him, rubbing her thigh lightly against the growing bulge in his pants. Gretel ran her fingers through her brother's shaggy blonde hair. Did it hurt? Do you want it to? Oh yes, brother. 
Gretel's voice was husky and eager. I do. He brought her foot to his mouth and began kissing her toes. Then rest assured, cherished sibling, that is will. Elizabeth finished sweeping and forcing herself not to look at the camper across the small gravel street. Crouching, she thought, like a predator about to strike, returned inside the gingerbread brown double wide in which she was supposed to be living. It was important she not broadcast the fact she knew anything about the people over there. The police had been very clear on that point. She let the door squeak and slam behind her and stalked into the living room. I can't take much more of this. It's not fair. It's too dangerous. Near the window from where she had been watching Elizabeth play and working outside, Detective Pixie Emberlight shook her head tiredly. This was a song she'd heard before from the felon many times in the past few days. You're the one who agreed to the parole terms, Liz. I really don't want to hear it. It's insane, Elizabeth exclaimed, falling onto the sofa in a huff. Just because a person does one bad thing. Seven, Pixie interjected. You had seven girls in your castle, Liz, and as I recall, not a single one of them wanted to be there. I wasn't going to hurt them, Elizabeth sulked. Change the record, Pixie sighed. I mean it, Elizabeth insisted. I was not going to hurt them. You had them in iron cages, Liz, dangling over a huge fire. But I wasn't going to eat them. That was sensationalist anti-witch journalism at work. I didn't want their blood either, only their sweat. The perspiration of a terrified virgin is incredibly potent. Ugh, that's gross, Liz. Pixie absently tossed her radio from one tiny hand to the other, pink wings hanging limply from her back in the sweltering heat of the trailer. Really, really gross. As the witch went on yet again about the inherent biases of the legal system, the obvious inconsistencies in the testimony of her so-called captives, and the rampant and institutionalized discrimination against witches, the fairy detective tuned out her charges rant and eyed the adjacent trailer. Even with the nearby backup she knew was on hand, several undercover officers stationed around the park in the guise of residents... Pixie was nervous. If Hansel and Gretel had done even half the awful things they'd been linked to, they were worth being wary of. Pixie wished her partner, Detective Papa Grislowski, was there, just in case. Nothing like an enormous, angry bear to discourage resistance in a suspect. Then, feeling the sodden clothes clinging to her feverish skin, she was thankful he was not. The grumpy brown behemoth currently halfway through a 90-day suspension for excessive use of force, was even more gruff when uncomfortable, or hungry, and comfort had thus far been in short supply on this assignment. Pixie stood and stretched, breaking her hands through her short blonde hair, unsticking it momentarily from her scalp and forehead, knowing full well it would soon be plastered there again. Too much to ask, she mused, that the department should furnish this little ambush with a trailer that had AC. She could almost hear the chief gasping at the very suggestion, nervously tying his long, floppy ears and knots. Ugh, you're not listening, Elizabeth said, bitter tone cutting through the fog of Pixie's thoughts. I can tell you're not paying attention to a word I've been saying. Pixie stood and flew across the room, hovering so as to look the seated witch in the eyes. I'm not here to listen to you, Liz. I'm here to keep you alive. If this is taking too long, you're welcome to go back to prison right now. I've got places I'd rather be too, you know. Now shut up and let's just get through this. Sheepishly, the witch looked away first. Sure, she said, nervously twirling thin fingers through her long black hair. Whatever you say. Pixie returned to her post by the window, her absent partner's favorite refrain ringing in her mind. I need a hibernation. From the open bedroom door in the trailer's short hallway, a cool as ice voice said, You girls should play nicer together. Oh God, Pixie thought. No hibernation today. Officer Nick Jersey sauntered into the living room, carrying his pointy-toed biker boots in one hand 
straightening his shiny, well-oiled hair with the other. He winked at Elizabeth, and she blushed. Maybe you should kiss and make up, he shrugged. Bite me, Jersey. Pixie cast her eyes pointedly out the window, away from him. Anywhere you point, Pixie. Jersey grinned, sitting down next to Elizabeth on the sofa, closer than he needed to. He began putting on his boots, stretching and flexing his muscular arms unnecessarily. She being mean to you, Lizzie. Elizabeth's fingers worked her hair faster as she cast a spiteful side glance at Pixie, then quickly turned her full, beaming attention to the undercover officer. No, I'm all right, she said, letting just the right amount of quavering enter her voice. It's nothing, really. I'm here to help us all, however I can. Pixie groaned. That's a real great outlook, Lizzie, Jersey said, rising to stretch. His was buff in a lean and wiry way, with a sharply angular face adorned with long sideburns and stubble too patchy to be called a true beard. Boots on, he was now free to utilize both hands and the taming of his greasy dark hair. When finished, his two small horns protruded only slightly from the impeccable pompadour. Did I miss anything? He asked. It's your shift to sleep, Pixie said. What do you want? It's impossible to nod off knowing two such lovely creatures sit so close and in such harrowing danger. Jersey said, rolling the ever-present matchstick from one corner of his mouth to the other with his tongue. Pixie chuckled. <laughs> My hero. Now, Pixie, that's very kind, but... I would say the real heroes are the working stiffs out there. The average citizens who get up every day and go to work at their honest, if lackluster, jobs and do the best they can. Hmm, magnanimous, Pixie said. You read that in a cologne ad? It's just what's in my heart. Jersey looked from the fairy to the witch with hyper-earnest puppy dog eyes a look he'd obviously perfected through years of diligent practice. It was perhaps not surprising as his occupation was manipulation, and even Pixie couldn't fault him for being good at it. Elizabeth sighed, wide eyes shiny with rapture. Oh, you are a charming devil, officer, Pixie said. You're half right. Then she stuck her tongue out and inserted a finger down her throat. Jersey laughed breezily. Oh, that's what I like about you, Pixie. You're tough, hard to impress. Mm, I like that in a woman. I outrank you, Pixie said. Just a reminder. Jersey turned and on his heel and strode toward the bathroom, calling over his shoulder. I like that in a woman, too. As soon as Jersey was out of sight, Elizabeth's face hardened again and she resumed glaring at Pixie. The hibernation... The haggard detective thought longingly once more. A long, long hibernation. She thought, it wasn't enough I'd gotten stuck babysitting the most reluctant, least cooperative assistant the department ever dredged up while pursuing two probable psychopaths. No, she was now also doomed to spend who knew how many days in a tiny, unbearably hot trailer with a walking erection like Nick Jersey. He was an arrogant, sexist, immature skirt chaser, with more oil in his hair than his gauche, deafening Harley. Basically, he was just her type. Dusk came, and with the growing darkness the camper cooled at last. As sleep proved impossible, Hansel occupied himself in the living room with push-ups and planks, working to gasping exhaustion, then pausing to feel the sweat become chilly on his skin. Between sets, he moved to looking on Gretel in the small bunk at the rear of the trailer. She was naked and perfect, lying absolutely still atop of the covers, knees curled to her chest, sucking her thumb. It was an old nervous habit, one that often resurfaced before they went hunting. Poor girl, Ansel thought. She'd selflessly done her best all afternoon to exhaust him enough to sleep but succeeded only in draining herself. He moved quietly to drape a spare sheet over her, as even while he watched she began to shiver. 
Seeing her like this, curled up and sucking her thumb, he was immediately returned to the old days, the bad days, when she'd been forced to likewise cower on a threadbare blanket on the filthy stone floor of that awful creature's lair. His own situation had been even more unbearable. The sickly sweet taste of chocolate filled his mouth then, and the awful gritty sensation of dissolving cotton candy, the thick and sticky feel of syrup oozing down his throat. His guts roiled in protest, and Hansel put a fist to his lips to stifle a shriek. He walked away so as not to wake Gretel, breathing deeply, working to calm himself. It would be all right, he thought. It would be fine. He was not a little boy anymore. He was nobody's prisoner. He would be nobody's meal. Gretel was safe too. They were both safe, and they would make sure that no children ever suffered as they had. The cold light of good would burn away the darkness of those pagan monsters, and he was the bearer of the torch. Hansel returned to the floor and began a new set of push-ups, faster this time. He wondered how many they'd saved already, how many had been spared a traumatic ordeal, or worse. With every witch they killed, the world was made a better place, he was certain of it. And if a few of the whores, as the newspapers later claimed, had not truly been witches, well, what of that? Better to be too thorough, he thought. Better safe than sorry. Hansel had no inclination to mourn for those contemptible pretenders, those filthy she-devils, when, at the hands of real witches, so many children still suffered. Their tortured screams ripped through his brain whether he was sleeping or awake, burning his mind as surely as flame-heated cage bars had once upon a time scorched his formerly soft, doughy flesh. Now, he was hard. He was a man. A warrior. His sweat rained under the carpet beneath him, flowing freely as a recent widow's tears. There are many witches in the world, he thought. Too many, it seemed at times, for even slayers like them to ever make a difference. To the pain, Hansel smiled, taking comfort in knowing that even so, by tomorrow, there would be at least one less. From the other room, he heard Gretel cry out and rush to her. She was holding the sheet tightly around herself, shaking violently. Hansel sat, took her in his arms, and felt his sister shivering. It's fine, he said, stroking her hair. You're safe. I dreamt she was here, Gretel sobbed, breath hot in his ear, fingernails biting into his back. She's not, Hansel said. We killed her already, and more of her ilk besides. Not enough of them. Gretel hissed. Never enough, Hansel agreed. When's this one? She said. Are you ready? He nodded solemnly. Gretel's right hand stole between his thighs, skilled fingers going to work as she began nibbling his ear. Then tell me quickly once more, beloved brother, exactly what you're going to do to her. Pixie sat in her customary spot near the window, peering through the darkness at the silent trailer across the street, sipping a can of battery acid-like energy drink. She was tired, and it was her turn to sleep. Jersey's shift started half an hour ago, but her eyelids defied her and remained steadfastly open. So, she decided to lean into insomnia and cracked a can of go-go juice, determined to wait out the night and get the drop on the monsters next door. If they do anything at all, Pixie thought, if they're even the right ones. It was true there was no actual evidence linking the two anti-witch activists to any of the brutal murders, but their movements were tracked easily enough, and they'd been in all the right places. Of course, it was equally possible that one of their more rabid fans had gotten worked up enough after attending a speaking event, 
drunk enough on hate and fear to go out and commit the murders. Still, their motivations were certainly obvious. Their rhetoric was hateful enough, and no better suspects had yet materialized despite an exhaustive search. Pixie had not actually worked the case, but being the first fairy to advance past the rank of desk clerk in department history, she knew all too well the power of perception. There were bad witches out there, sure, but there were also plenty of good witches and normal, not special witches all over the place. But aside a few obvious loonies, like Elizabeth, and a few genuine monsters, like the ones that so famously attacked young Hansel and Gretel, and witches were on the whole not much different than anyone else. And, even if they were all the deranged child murderers the siblings proclaimed them to be, there was no excuse for the things Pixie had seen in the case file. Some acts are truly unforgivable. Jersey sat slouched on the sofa, flipping through a motorcycle magazine. He was the lead officer on the case and, shockingly, had somehow not bungled it. Yet. Actually, Pixie had been forced to reluctantly admit he seemed like a pretty good cop. Elizabeth snored loudly in the bedroom. Pixie had been brought in to help with the snare operation when she'd suddenly found herself temporarily without a partner. The highly publicized parole of such a notorious and controversial witch as Elizabeth, the brass figured, could not help but bring the killers out of hiding. Hansel and Gretel had shown up in the same trailer park the police had registered with the board as Elizabeth's new home. That, surely, was not a coincidence. Then what, Pixie wondered, are they waiting for? If they're the witch hunters, why haven't they made a move yet? It had been three days and the siblings had not so much as set foot outside their camper in that time, let alone showed any interest in Elizabeth. Maybe the crystal gazers and head peepers had been wrong after all. The fizzy drink hurt Pixie's stomach, and every time she glanced at Jersey he seemed to know it somehow and was always looking at her. She couldn't take much more of his stupid, smirking face before she just knew she'd do something she'd regret. Pixie rose to dump the rest of the drink down the drain, guts protesting what she'd already forced down, when she caught a whiff of smoke. Something burning. Do you smell that? She said. What? Jersey asked. Is something burning? He sniffed. Probably somebody burning garbage or something. We couldn't move all the tenants out before this got started. Mm, It's getting stronger, Pixie said. Jersey sat up, magazine forgotten. You're right. Pixie glanced out the front window, saw nothing. She moved the kitchen area and looked out the smaller window above the sink. There, in the yard, a bonfire blazed against the dark, a large iron pole jutting up from the center. There could be no mistake. It was a witch-burning fire. A silhouette moved between it and the window, blocking her view. Get ready, Pixie said, reaching for the radio. What is it? Jersey said. The door exploded inward and an enormous figure strode in, large boots clomping with each heavy step. The vintage gas mask strapped over the face obscured the person's identity, but the flowing mane of blonde hair and the thick, muscular build clearly evident beneath the long, shiny black trench coat left little doubt as to who it was. Hansel said nothing as his goggle-covered eyes moved first to Pixie, then to Jersey. His gloved hands raised a strange, gun-like device. It was attached to his large backpack by a thin length of hose. He aimed at Pixie, and an ear-splitting hiss bellowed throughout the trailer before a spark at the mouth of the weapon's barrel engorged it into flame. Hansel squeezed the grip, and a beam of fire arced towards Pixie. Even as she took off flying to the ceiling, wings a madly buzzing blur... Pixie knew she was too slow, and then Nick Jersey was there, leaping between her and the oncoming inferno, becoming engulfed in the conflagration midair. Hovering at the ceiling, Pixie drew her service weapon and fired three times, striking the masked figure in the chest with each shot. He shuffled backwards slightly, 
but seemingly unfazed by the bullets raised the flamethrower again in her direction. Nick Jersey writhed on the floor, a squirming ball of fire. In the hallway, Elizabeth appeared and began to scream like something out of a bad horror movie. Hansel turned from Pixie and set his sights on the witch, shouting curses and threats that were muffled by his thick mask. Pixie flew into action, zipping across the room to tackle Elizabeth. They both went tumbling back into the bedroom just as an explosion of fire tore through the hall. Leaning quickly out of the doorway, Pixie fired three more times before yet another blast of flame forced her to duck back inside the doorway. Smoke was thick in the trailer now, and the crackle of flames deafening. Pixie turned and fired twice, shattering the glass of the bedroom window. Get out! She shouted. Get out now! Backup's close! A fresh eruption in the hallway further spread the advancing flames. The bedroom doorway was a blazing portal to hell. A void suddenly filled with the looming, black-clad figure of Hansel. He stomped determinedly into the room, smoke billowing and fires blazing behind him. Outside, Pixie heard the cacophony of sirens cutting through the roar of the inferno. Thought she heard people yelling, too. She fired the pistol empty as Elizabeth scrambled out the window, and Hansel moved steadily forward. She aimed for his thighs, for his neck, at his face. Each time the rounds were deflected with a metallic ping or absorbed with seemingly little impact. Hansel was rocked back on his heels slightly, and maybe he grunted as it punched, but still he advanced. The smoke was blindingly thick as Pixie flew toward the window. Sure, once again she was dead. Sure, she was too far away, moving too slowly. A grip like a vice closed on her ankle. The feeling of hot rubber burned her skin. Her wings flapped frantically as she kicked and strained toward the window. But Hansel's hold was inexorable. Pixie turned to fight, saw her own grim face, flushed and smeared with dirt, reflected in the lifeless abyss of the goggles. Let's go, she said. You're going to need breadcrumbs to find your way back from the ass-kicking I'm about to give you. Hansel pulled the fairy close, letting go of his flamethrower. It dangled absently at his side as he reached for her neck with an enormous gloved hand. Pixie reversed course quickly, driving herself fists first, with everything she had into Hansel's face, punching and kicking blindly as he tumbled backward into the fire-engulfed hallway, dragging her along. On his back, rocking on the larger pack, Hansel swatted a Pixie, each blow a bone-snapping, bell-ripping assault on the petite fairy. One of Pixie's fists went straight through the glass of Hansel's left goggle then, and at last he screamed as bits of glass in her determined hand dug into the soft, squishy orb beneath. Moaning, he brought both hands together around her neck and squeezed. Pixie gasped and fought to loosen his awesome grip, but felt blackness sneaking in at the corners of her blurring vision. Suddenly, a lanky crimson figure appeared towering above them. His long, curved horns brushed against the sagging roof as waves of fire raced across it. Nick Jersey's yellow eyes blazed with all the horrors of biblical hell as he brought one cloven hoof down on Hansel's face again and again, his elongated, needle-like teeth bared in a gruesome smile. As Hansel's hands slid away, Pixie dashed to the window, gasping and choking even as she flew outside into the cool night air and observed the scene below. Gretel, clad in her own long black coat, had hold of Elizabeth. She was pressing a huge knife to the witch's throat as the advancing cops fanned out, guns trained at the screaming killer, ordering them back, calling desperately for her brother. A police helicopter circled overhead casting a large spotlight over the deteriorating situation. Pixie collapsed onto the dewy grass, gulping air and massaging her neck. Behind her, Jersey leapt from the window as the fire finally engulfed the trailer completely. Inside, as the ceiling began to rush down to meet him, the sick brain and Hansel's damaged skull had just enough time to recognize the strange, insistent hissing sound that came from beneath him for what it was. And, 
as his body was crushed by debris and eaten by fire, he was present enough, at least, to be thankful when the tank on his back exploded. Pixie leaned against the ambulance, an ice pack taped around her throbbing neck and a blanket draped over her shoulders, watching the paramedics carry the bound and struggling Gretel to the nearby unit. She raved about the evil witches and screamed for her brother, swearing vengeance on everybody in sight in the whole world too. The bullet in her shoulder, she did not seem to notice. The explosion had knocked everybody down. Whatever Hansel had filled that weapon with, it was no joke. In the confusion, one of the undercover cops had gotten off a shot at Gretel. It had been enough to make her let go of the witch, at least for a second, though she'd been far from easy to subdue even then. Inside the ambulance, Pixie heard Elizabeth wailing and carrying on about her own horrific injuries, wounds which were, apparently, invisible. She hadn't been scratched. The weary detective shook her head, turning to watch the blazing pile of rubble that had been a trailer not two hours ago. Already the flames were dying down. Then, her attention was commanded by a very familiar growl. Where is she? Roared Detective Papa Grislowski. Uniformed police at the tape line ducked and dodged the enraged bear's wildly swinging paws as he burst through their ranks, bellowing, Where is she? Pixie waved and could not help but smile. The brown bear's fur was wild and messy, and he put on a few pounds. Obviously, suspension disagreed with him. His trademark tan trench coat flapped behind him like a cape, though there was a strange void on his chest where his badge was usually pinned, as he rushed over and swept her up in a, well, in a bear hug. It was the only kind he was capable of. Watch the ribs, Grizz, she winced. He put her down, paws meticulously smoothing her hair, her blanket. Are you all right? I'm fine. How'd you get here so fast? I had a scanner on at home, Grizz said. Heard the whole thing. You listen to the scanner at home? Pixie laughed. Had to. Nothing else drowns out my daughter's music. I'm bored, Pixie. God, I'm bored. She tenderly massaged her aching ribs. Sorry to hear your vacation is so rough, big guy. Behind Grizz, a throat was cleared and the faint scent of sulfur and autumn wood smoke wafted over them. The detectives looked in unison at Nick Jersey. His skin was smooth as glass and red as blood. Long black horns tapered to knife-like ends high above his hairless, skeletal face. In his mouth was a fresh match. He held a blanket around his waist with one hand and offered Pixie her pistol back with the other. Thought you'd want this. I found it inside. <laughs> Thanks. She reached for the gun. Did you find anything left of Hansel? Jersey nodded. Hmm. Hope he dies soon, for his sake. What I drug out of there bears very little resemblance to a... Hmm. Human being. Grizz. Jersey nodded. How's life? Grizz growled, baring his teeth. Hmm. All right, then. Jersey's free hand raised in a placating gesture. So, the bad boy biker look, Pixie said. That's what? An undercover thing? That's just vanity, Pixie. It's a devil thing. Wait, so you can look like whatever you want and that was what you chose? Grizz shifted awkwardly from one paw to the other, eyed the scurrying responders. Other people have cocoa, he said. Why don't you have cocoa? Huh. I'm fine, Grizz, Pixie said. I'm fine too, Grizz, Jersey said. By the way. Hey, Grizz bellowed at a passing EMT. Why doesn't she have cocoa? The man threw up his hands and walked on. I'm... I'm... I'm getting you cocoa. The bear lumbered away, 
leaving the fairy and the devil to eye each other cautiously. You okay? She asked finally. Oh, fire won't kill us. But it sure does hurt. Jersey shrugged. I did really like those boots, though. So that sucks. Pixie nodded at his blanket. I miss your pants more. Pixie, babe, you couldn't handle what's under here. Jersey extended his hand and a small puff of smoke formed in a business card. But maybe we can get together sometime if you want to. Prove me wrong. My life is enough devils in it, thanks. He winked in a way that was somehow not completely lecherous. The world's full of devils, but there's only one Nick Jersey. Pixie's eyes went from the car to meet his gaze, and, for the second time that night, she could not help but smile. I'm a detective, Jersey, remember? When? That is... If I should want you, I... I can always find you. Easily. Grizz returned, a steaming cup in each paw. Here, he said, offering one to Pixie and draining the other himself in one large gulp. Narrowed eyes fixed on Jersey. Let's get you out of here. She took the cup, nodded at the devil, and allowed Grizz to lead her to his car. Eyeing the small, blonde detective as she walked away, Jersey said aloud, I think I'm in love. Say what? asked a passing firefighter. You okay, buddy? Hmm, maybe, Nick Jersey said. I'm hoping it'll pass. They drove in silence, windows down and the refreshing night air rushing in around them. Pixie smelled the cigar smoke in Grizz's fur, in the upholstery of his car, but said nothing. Tonight, she was just glad to see him. It wasn't worth it. There was still paperwork and reports to be finished, questions to be answered and sleep, hopefully, in her future before she had the luxury of time enough to worry about her partner's habits. Grizz drove in his typically glacial, meandering way, eventually a few blocks from the station, He broke the serenity. So, what's, um, with you and Jersey the devil? Oh, nothing, Pixie said. Why you ask? Grizz slipped a cigar between his teeth and lit up. Just seems like your type. Come on, Grizz. Please don't. The bear puffed. Tell me I'm wrong and I'll put it out. Pixie turned her face to the open window, breathed the fresh air. Grizz puffed harder and gave an exaggerated sigh of enjoyment. I've got my vices, Pixie, and you have yours. Mine is less disgusting, by the way, but they're both lethal. Be careful, okay? You'll live longer. I don't know, Grizz, she said. Getting old doesn't sound like too much fun. Grizz stifled a cough. It's not. His cough worsened, and his big body was suddenly racked by a hacking fit. Pixie reached out and turned on the radio, covering the noise of her partner's struggle, masking his embarrassment. She had yet to ask about his persistent cough, and tonight didn't seem like the time to do that either. As Grizz slowly recovered and caught his breath, she stared dead ahead into the darkness Pixie heard the faint sound of sirens somewhere in the endless night surrounding them, felt her neck and ribs ache with each breath, and understood that in this life, there were only ever less sad endings, and that nothing is ever forever after. Until then, dear listener, as you lie alone in the dark, 
when able to close your eyes. Just keep telling yourself. It's only a story. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by, yours truly, Jason Hill. Additional performers have been featured when necessary to bring the tales to life. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respected authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Luke Hodgkinson under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's artwork and logo by Jason Hill. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Horror Hill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure that you never miss an episode. And please, leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Thursday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button too to tell us how we're doing. Oh. And if you could, please leave a kind word, or even a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories, including more performance from yours truly, and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, You'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Thursday with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, this is Jason Hill. Good evening. <laughs>